Lesson number 12 on transforming truths. Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. The law of the harvest. The law of the harvest. These great lessons from Dr. Paul Chapel, way out in Lancaster, California. Uh, I do want to mention to you, in, in uh, a couple of weeks, we're going to begin uh, talking, and I'll do this probably throughout the year, uh, begin uh, sharing messages around a theme that the Southern Baptist Convention has put out. It's an evangelistic emphasis, and it's entitled, Who's Your One? Who's your one? The one that you would like to see come to faith in Jesus Christ. And we're, we're gonna, they're going to give us some promotional materials, but also uh, some ideas of, of how to invite them to church, how to share the gospel with our one. And so I want you to be thinking about that one that you know God has placed on your heart or pray about uh, the one God would place on your heart that you would love to see come to faith in Jesus Christ and then we're going to commit that to prayer. We're going to commit to sharing the gospel with them after we've been trained in how to share the gospel and we're going to culminate, I'm not sure what Sunday, but we're going to culminate with bringing our one to the house of God and it'll be a real evangelistic service in hopes and in prayers of uh, leading them to faith in Jesus Christ. And then I want you to I want you to write this down if you would, if you've got a, a pen. I sent out an email on Monday uh, about uh, an article from the Houston Chronicle. The Houston Chronicle for about the last two years, they have been looking at sexual misconduct in churches. And of course, that is a buzzword now uh, in the political arena, seeing uh, every, everything that's going on with our politicians, our judges, I mean, things are coming out of the woodwork about, about uh, the past. And, and I'm just praying that nobody in here finds an old yearbook and sees me, my face painted or sees, uh, sees some stupid note that I wrote years ago. Or, um, uh, so I'm hiding all my yearbooks, okay? Uh, and I'm trying to confiscate any, any others. And Chad Seaburn's laughing, but he's in there with me. So, um, but... Uh, but we're hearing a lot, and, and the Houston Chronicle has, has done a three-part uh, three uh, documentary, report, whatever you want to call it, and I sent you the, first, the, the link to the first part of the report, uh, over 700 victims uh, in the Southern Baptist Convention over the years that we know of, that they had records on, who had... Uh, been assaulted or molested by ministers uh, or volunteers uh, in their Southern Baptist Church, and uh, it names names. Uh, some of uh, my heroes uh, are cast in a, a less than stellar light in the way their churches handled certain situations. Part two uh, came out, I believe, uh, yesterday, and part three came out today. And I would like for you, if you've not read these, uh, if you'll write down this address, uh, website, HoustonChronicle.com. I want you to go to HoustonChronicle.com and I want you to read all three parts of this report. It's uh, basically, in, it's, it's right on the front page of the Houston Chronicle website and uh, it won't take, hard, won't take you long to find it. It's, it's called An Abuse of Faith and the report that they did and uh, even uh, today, I saw a picture of a minister in our state that uh, has been arrested uh, for uh, a crime that he committed, I believe, in Alabama years ago. But he was in this report in the Houston Chronicle, and he was arrested either yesterday, I guess it was yesterday or early this morning, because he had moved to the state of South Carolina, and uh, it just caught up with him, caught up to him. And so... If you'll go and read these, you'll, you'll understand some of the uh, things that we're going to be doing in the future ASAP as far, as far as our volunteers go, working with our young people all the way down to our preschoolers. Uh, some things that we're going to implement. Tim and I are going to a conference in a couple of weeks uh, put on by the South Carolina Baptist Convention, but I went ahead and handed the staff tonight uh, some new
new guidelines as far as federal background checks go, policies that we're going to put into place here um, at Blue Ridge View to make sure we're going to err on the side of safety. Some of you are going to look at it as a volunteer or teacher and you're going to say, this is a, this is a little bit invasive. Well, we're going to err on the side of safety for our kids. I believe Jesus spoke of how serious it was to keep our kids safe. And if we, we allow harm to come to them, then uh, it'd be better for us to have a millstone hung around our neck and thrown in the water or in the pond, the lake, the sea, than to harm our little children. And so we're going we're gonna to do, we're going to put in place some, some uh, uh, serious procedures you want to work with our kids, uh, youth uh, through preschoolers. I mean, you're going to have to give us your life history, basically, um, so that we can not just do a state background check, but a, a federal background check, and then, then it's going to have listed uh, procedures that we're going to go by as a church uh, for uh, if, if something comes up on somebody, if there's an accusation here. The, the procedures we're going to follow, what we're going to do when we have sexual uh, uh, assault uh, uh, folks that, that have been convicted of a crime, um, they're on the uh, offender registry, what we're going to do as a church if they visit Blue Ridge View Baptist Church, if they're saved at Blue Ridge View Baptist Church, I mean, these are all things that we've got to think about and uh, that we're going to do. So, so you'll be seeing more about that in the days to come. So I want, but I want you to, it, it'll put it in perspective if you'll go read uh, th this report, the three parts of this report, especially the one that was put out today. It's tough read, very tough read. Um, but it, it just reminds us that we can't be too careful. All right, real quick, Galatians chapter 6. We sow seeds uh, every moment of our lives, spiritually speaking now, we sow seeds uh, every day of our lives, and the Bible has a clear law about what happens to the seeds that we sow as believers. This law guarantees us that we will reap spiritual benefits, but that we'll, we'll also reap consequences of the seeds that we sow. And so we got to invest our lives in, in planting godly seeds so that one day we will reap a godly harvest. I want you to notice what Paul says in Galatians 6, beginning in verse uh, uh, number 7. Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Our transforming truth uh, for this lesson gives us a law. And it is something that will definitely happen on this earth. Think, think about this with me. On this earth we have laws that are fixed. We have the law of gravity. What goes up must come down. It's irreversible. Uh, our laws of science, uh, they may have a few exceptions, but listen, this law in the Bible has no exceptions. According to this verse, we will reap what we sow. Now, that excites me. Uh, I mean, it's exciting because it gives me confidence that, that we will see fruit from our labor, labor if we faint not. I mean, we just, we just, we're, we're not responsible for the fruit. I, I have to remind myself of that every week. I'm not responsible for the fruit. I just know that uh, though that uh, the Lord has called me to plant the seed, and at some point there is going to be fruit from some of that seed. But listen, we will also reap the consequences for sowing bad seeds. Uh, that's what this law teaches. We can choose what seeds to sow. We can sow good seeds and reap a harvest, or we can sow wicked seeds and reap the consequences. And the choice is entirely up to us. So for the next couple of three weeks, we're going to study the three laws of the harvest. What are the three laws of the harvest? Well, number one, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. That's the first law of the harvest, which we'll see tonight. The second law is 
you reap later than you sow. You reap later than, and then third, you reap more than you sow. Each of these laws has specific applications that, that we can apply to our lives right now. When we walk out of here, we can apply these to our lives. So the first thing, the first law that we see is this. You reap what you sow. I look out here and there's no, no doubt, I know there's some gardeners in this room. If I were to ask you, have you ever been surprised by a plant that grew from the seed you planted? Most would say, unless you just don't have a green thumb, most would say, well, well no, uh, I'm not surprised uh, because when I planted watermelon seeds, I was not expecting a banana. I mean, uh, or I wasn't expecting a potato, or I wasn't expecting peanuts. I was expecting watermelon. So you're not surprised when you plant a watermelon seed that you get watermelon. Or if you sow tomatoes, you, you're going to reap tomatoes. You reap the fruit uh, of whatever seed you plant. And so you reap what you sow. So here's what I want you to write down concerning uh, this first law. Uh, when, when we reap what we sow, think about this. We need to see our thoughts, our words, and our actions as seeds. As believers, we need to see our thoughts, our words, and our actions as seeds. Now think with me about thoughts. Do you realize that you are planting seeds every moment of every day, and every single thought you think plays a role in molding your character? That's why we have to be so careful about what we think. Every thought that I think plays a role in, in molding who I am. It's a seed that is sown, and, and at some point that seed is going to mature. And so all seeds of thought need to go through the test of Philippians 4.8. All seeds of thought need to go through the sieve of Philippians 4.8. Listen to what Philippians 4.8 says. Finally, brethren, Chad, we've been studying this in Sunday school. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So when we're talking about our thoughts and how they mold our character, uh, we need to make sure that we process our thoughts through Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. All right, now think with me about your words. Our thoughts should be viewed as seeds, but also our words. Do you realize how much power you possess just from the words you say? The power that you... You hear me say this all the time. I love the Proverbs. And the writer of Proverbs says that in my mouth, this tongue has the power of life and death. Now you think about that for a moment. That is absolutely true. I can lift somebody up. I can encourage them. It'll give them life. It'll give them a reason for going on. Or I can degrade them. I can criticize them. I can say a hurtful word that leads ultimately to their downfall. Their destruction. If you have your Bibles, turn real quick to James 3. James 3, real quick. Just flip over a, a few pages. James 3. If you're there, say amen. All right, verse 4. Listen to this. Practical Christianity. Behold also the ships, which though they may be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. Even so, the tongue is a little member. And boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But listen to this. But the tongue no man can tame. 
<laughs> listen, listen what Jack, it is an unruly evil. It gets worse. It's full of deadly poison. <laughs> you see, the words that we speak have the potential to tear down or to build up. I, my words, think about this, my words have the potential to be a difference maker in somebody's life. Your words have the potential to absolutely change a person's life. So may we never take lightly the words that we speak to others. Every word we say is a seed that we plant. All right, and then think of your actions as a seed. Your actions, my actions, matter very much. And our actions matter whether or not anybody sees them or not. This, uh, this report that I'm telling you about, about the Southern Baptist Convention and the, uh, the secrecy that was done in, in, in all these churches. You say, well, preacher, that's just out there in Houston and other states. No, my friend. It's, in, it's, uh, it's close. It's very close. But our actions, whether or not anybody else sees them, our actions matter. God always sees what we do whether good or whether evil. Proverbs 15, 3, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord, listen to this, are in every place beholding the evil and the good. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Hey, if you believe that God is faithful, you have to believe that He's going to fulfill the law of the harvest in your life. If you believe He will fulfill the law, then we ought to be watching our thoughts. We ought to be watching our actions and our words because they're all seeds that we'll plant. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the businessman Stephen Covey. He's a great leadership guru. He said this. He said, you sow a thought, you reap an action. Sow an action and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. And you sow a character, you reap a destiny. I have seen that so much in people's lives. May we all pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us as we sow these seeds every single day. See our thoughts, words, and actions as seeds. But write this down when we're talking about how we reap what we sow. See God's sovereignty bring to pass man's choices. See God's sovereignty bring to pass man's choices. If this is a law, then my question is, who's administering this law? Who's giving this law? Better yet, who is enforcing this law? If, if this is a law, who's enforcing this law? Listen, God Himself. God is enforcing the law. His sovereignty works in the natural kingdom, in the, in the natural realm. We put beans in, we're going to get beans out. But the same God who is sovereign over the garden is the same God who is sovereign over our choices. If we sow wrong seeds, then we're going to reap weeds. If we sow godly seeds, we're going to reap abundant fruit. Man proposes his way, but God is the one who disposes the results as he sees fit. Proverbs 16, 9, listen to this. The writer of Proverbs says, Proverbs says, A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. One well, of the best examples in, in your Bible of sowing and reaping you find in the life of Jacob. You read the story of Jacob. Early in Jacob's life, what did he do? He deceived his father for his own selfish gain. Cheated his brother out of his birthright. Shortly after that event, Laban deceived Jacob into marrying uh, Leah, not Rachel, but Leah. Laban did that for his own selfish gain. gain. Years later, Jacob was deceived again, this time by his sons. Again, it was for his own selfish gain. So Jacob sowed deceitful seeds, and God's sovereignty allowed him to reap the consequences. Are you listening? Say amen. What a tragedy it was for Jacob to spend over a decade believing that his son, his favorite child, Joseph, was dead. Only to find out years later that he hadn't died. His sons had deceived him and had sold him off as a slave. You see, if we're living with hidden sin right now, 
man, let's don't live comfortably there. The Bible says we will reap the consequences of unconfessed sin. Listen to the Bible, Numbers 32, 23. But if ye will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And be sure, your sin will find you out. You may be thinking, you know, I, I don't know if that verse is true. I mean, I cheated on a test in high school. I, I, I didn't get caught. I don't know, man, I mean, I, I slipped up and I stole something down there at CVS. And, and that was 20 years ago. I, I didn't get caught. Well, beware. The Bible says your sin will find you out. It may be in that moment or it may be years later. Like the minister I was talking about today. Maybe years later. You know what? Your sin may find you out by just giving you a guilty conscience every single day. Losing sleep. Can't sleep. It can come in a variety of ways. But always remember, sin is the best detective this world has ever known. You cannot hide from unconfessed sin. And then last of all, see the conflict of the garden of your heart. See the conflict of the garden of your heart. In the garden of your heart, you don't have room for good and bad seeds. Your old nature and your new nature are both fighting over what or who will plant in the garden. Galatians 5.17, listen to it. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Every single day, you've heard me say this before, but every single day of your life, the flesh wakes up and the flesh says, boy, I've got stuff to plant in the garden today. But the Spirit also says, if you've been saved, the Spirit also says, you know what? I have some seeds that I need to plant in the garden today as well. Every day of your life, there's a battle. And to whom you surrender your garden is the key to a faithful life. Whom will you allow to cultivate the garden of your heart and plant the seeds for future growth? If you want your new nature to plant the seeds, you have to purpose in your heart and purpose in your mind that you will allow Him to. And you do this by casting out every sin in your life that you know of. You cast it out. Yield in complete submission to the Holy Ghost. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 5, and I'm through. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. You reap what you sow. That's the first law of the harvest. Father, we love you tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving us and we thank you for your word. And Lord, uh, I pray tonight Lord, uh, that this, this uh, truth would encourage us tonight. To know, Lord, that if we just keep sowing good seed, Lord, eventually we're, we're going to reap a godly harvest. And, uh, Lord, we know that, that uh, you're in charge of that harvest. But, Lord, we're in charge of the planting. And so I, I pray that we, we wouldn't faint. We would continue in the work. No matter, no matter if we've seen a harvest yet or not, you tell us it's coming. And uh, we reap what we sow. And so, Lord, I pray every day we would reap or we would sow good thoughts. I pray that we would sow good words. I pray, Lord Jesus, we would sow good actions. I pray, Lord Jesus, in the area of our words that we would sow the seed of the gospel into the hearts of people, into their lives. And, Lord, one day, believing that we're going to see, uh, Lord, that harvest come in. And then, Lord Jesus, I, I pray that we'd be challenged. And, Lord, certainly you challenge me. Lord, it's almost uh, frightening to think of, Lord, our sin finding us out, those sins that we don't confess. I'm glad, Lord Jesus, your word teaches that any sin I confess, Lord Jesus, you cover. Lord Jesus, any sin that I don't confess, you uncover. And so, Lord, I pray that we would keep short accounts with you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would confess our sin, forsake our sin, leave it, Lord Jesus, not harbored in our heart because your word says, be sure our sin will find us out. There are no secrets with you and us. And so Lord Jesus, I pray that, that each and every day, Lord, uh, that we would live in the spirit and not in the flesh. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, 845, Sunday morning, early service.
10 o'clock Sunday school, 11 o'clock second service, 6 p.m. evening worship. Work really, really hard to have somebody. We've been seeing some new faces. Always good to see new faces uh, in church. That's what it's all about. We need to be a uh, inside-out church. We need to take the church outside of these four walls and reach people for Jesus Christ. God bless y'all. I look forward to seeing you Sunday.